God bless you, Cornerstone. Will you pray with me? Our Father and our God, we gather together sinners saved by grace, in need of your mercy, desperate for your loving kindness. As we begin the Advent season, Lord God, give us this opportunity now to examine ourselves and our priorities, to see ourselves and to examine our motives and our desires. Shine the light of your Holy Spirit in this place today and be glorified in all that is done and said for your glory in Jesus' name. This is the second book that Peter has written to the saints. And in chapter three of Second Peter, he explains to them the reason for his writing this letter. He says that I am writing to you in order to stir up your sincere mind by way of a reminder. I'm writing to you to scramble up your mind by reminding you. And he's writing this letter because of the concern that he has that it is all too easy for the children of God to become complacent in our walk with Christ. And he is writing to them so that he can stir them up once again, so that he can help them to reprioritize their lives, their thought lives, and their deeds to remember and to never forget the words that were spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and by the apostles concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. I am writing to you so that you don't become complacent, so that you don't begin to take the second coming of Jesus Christ for granted. I'm writing to you so that you can maintain a sense of urgency about your sanctification and not to begin to rest on your laurels and to take the grace of God for granted. And he says, know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. And this is the question they're going to ask the church. This is the question they're going to ask you. Where is the promise of his coming? You've been talking about Jesus Christ is coming back again for years and years. Where is the promise? What are you talking about? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue just as they were from the beginning of creation. Where is the promise of his coming? Nothing is changing. Everything continues just like it was from the beginning. And this, in their view, proves their assertion that Jesus Christ will not come again to judge the world. This is their faith in monotony. Monotony is the deceitful culprit that numbs the senses and dulls our concentration. Monotony. Monotony breeds assumptions and it fosters unwarranted confidence that we know what's coming next. All things remain the same. Everything is monotonous. The mockers tend to think that because things have always been the same, things will never change. Where is the promise of his coming? Things never change. Before I continue, I want to help us to understand that while Peter is talking about the mockers and the unbelievers, he is actually using them as an example for the saints who may have become complacent in their walk with Christ. Many of us will never admit it, but in our heart of hearts, we ask the same question. Where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, ever since the Old Testament, ever since the beginning of creation, all things continue just as they were. Many saints have the same attitude and the same viewpoint. Peter is not writing to the saints to talk about unbelievers. He's not writing to the saints in order to gossip about how bad people in the world are. He's writing to the saints in order to stir up their spiritual imagination and to challenge their unconscious question, unconscious questioning of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because most believers do not live as though we believe Jesus Christ is actually physically coming again. And you can tell this by our actions and by our attitudes by our words and by our deeds. We are asking the same question through our asking, where is the promise of his coming? Is Jesus really coming back? I've been hearing this since I was a child and since I was a child, all things remain as they always were. 
Everything is monotony. Why should I believe that God is going to split the sky of this world's continuity and step down into time? Where is the promise of this coming? Nothing is changing. Everything remains the same. Peter makes this objection to their reasoning. He says in verse 5 of 2 Peter chapter 3 that when they say this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago. His point being simply that the creation herself is proof of divine intervention. When they say this, they demonstrate that God has come already. That God was not only involved, but that God is the creator of the experienced world. And when they speak of creation, they are speaking of a new work of God already. They are confessing that God has come before. And if they would go back and review the book of Genesis, they will see that in the very beginning, there was only chaos. They will see that the earth, Peter says, was underwater. But God intervened and the earth that was underwater was born out of the water so that the stability they are referring to when they speak about the creation, this stability was not always the case. And the world has not been as it was since the beginning. They're wrong. Without God's intervention, this consistent and predictable world that we experience would not even be here. God has already come. So even if all things continue as they are, God is the first cause. And if God has intervened before, God can and God will intervene again, according to the prophets and the apostles. But this simple observation escapes the notice of the mockers. And this simple point weakens their argument and identifies the flaw in their worldview. Humankind is not on our own, as the mockers would have us believe. But we were placed here, and we are here according to the intervention of God. God has intervened in creation since the beginning, and God continues to intervene. He continues each day to make his presence known. Creation declares his splendor every morning for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. But for those mockers, every day is like Groundhog Day. The wonder of creation represents nothing more than another spin on the wheels of fate, movement in the world without any destination, a mindless, meaningless matrix, and a plotless story. Where is the promise of his coming? Since the beginning, all things remain as they always were. Every day is Groundhog Day. Do you ever feel like that? Be honest with yourself. Or do you simply view every day as a mindless, meaningless matrix? The scoffer looks at his world and he is frustrated by the seeming continuity of all things. She has convinced herself based on her experiences that nothing ever changes. Interestingly though, if you were able to resurrect one of those mockers from Peter's day and plant them today in this 21st century, they would see just how off base their assumptions really were. He would be horrified to learn just how much worse off humanity is today as compared to Peter's time. And he would be able to see the natural consequences of such a hopeless worldview. Nothing changes. Everything remains the same. Everything remains as it was. But what he does not realize is that his argument also suspends him in time and in temperament. Because if creation does not change and he is a part of creation, then he cannot change. and He doesn't want to change. If God does not intervene and bring about change, then God cannot intervene and bring about change in his life so that what he is, he forever is destined to be. Maybe that worldview sounds familiar to us today. It is the self-serving, self-absorbed anthem of our day. I cannot change. I will not change. I see myself in a particular way based on a snapshot in time, and this is all that I am and all that I can be. There is no God who can change me. There is no God who will intervene. Nothing changes. Look around you, brothers and sisters. 
And behold the emptiness of the contemporary mind. Look around you and see the purposeless manner in which men spend their days, bound in the throes of boredom, continually seeking out new ways to destroy ourselves and our world, creating worlds to which we can independently escape the uniformity of life, developing new technologies to answer self-made problems. Humanity is bored. We lust for something new every hour. And we look to ourselves and not to God to bring about the change that we want to see. These mockers have no confidence in God's divine intervention. For them, this is all that is and all that ever will be. So when I look at the world, when we look at the world and the people that dwell here, on the one hand, I am alarmed at the amount of depression and anxiety that I see, the self-harm and willful depravity. On the one hand, I am alarmed, but on the other hand, it all makes perfect sense. If there is no chance that God is going to at last intervene in his creation, and this is truly all that there really is, then nothing really matters anyway. Man is insignificant. His actions do not matter. He does not matter. And this has to be the conclusion of all those who have no faith that Jesus Christ will come and intervene again. Peter goes on here to point out another fallacy in their argument, another fact that escaped their notice. He explains in verse 6 that the world at the time of creation was destroyed by being flooded with water. So then once again, all things do not continue as they were, like the scoffer has claimed. Genesis chapter 6 through 9 recount the historical narrative of the great flood, where once again the earth was submerged in water. And God through one family repopulated the entire planet. It was by God's intervention that creation came into existence. It was by God's intervention that the first earth was destroyed by a flood. And it was by God's intervention that the dry land once again appeared. God has judged creation before. All things do not remain as they always were. God has judged creation before and God is determined to judge his creation again. Peter says in verse 7 that by his word... The present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment. This is the reality that the mocker would like to ignore. This is the reality that many saints tend to ignore. That the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire and kept for the day of God's judgment. The day where God will judge the living and the dead. The day where every person will give an account for the things done in their body. The day of God's final justice. Over the years, I have come to really appreciate the Advent season. The chance to sanctify God in my heart in a much more intentional way. This opportunity to turn the lion's share of my attention toward heaven in anticipation of the second coming of Jesus Christ. I yearn for that day with all my heart. But we should understand that the day of the Lord will not only be a day of grace and vindication. For most of the world, the day of the Lord is going to be a day of judgment, and Peter says, and destruction of ungodly people. Neither I nor the apostle Peter make this claim with any sense of delight. No follower of Jesus Christ desires to see his fellow man sentenced to eternal punishment and eternal damnation. But the day is coming. And Jesus Christ will have the final say. And to the mocker, Jesus will say, depart from me. I do not know you. You have crowned yourself as your savior. You have made your lust your holy book. Now run to your lust for help. Run to your evil desires to rescue you from my judgment. Your sins cannot save you. Your willful rejection of the truth is not a defense. Wow. The mocker hears those words and laughs in my face and says, Calvin, those are merely empty threats. For where is the promise of his coming? Since the beginning of creation, all things continue as they were. Calvin, do you realize how many preachers have heralded the same threat before you? They have gone to the grave and you have taken their place with the same ridiculous message. 
But this same empty threat you proclaim has been being proclaimed for millennia. And guess what, preacher? Nothing has changed and nothing ever will. And with violent determination, the mocker brushes the warning aside and continues confidently in his way of destruction. Peter's words do not faze him at all. The facts of God's past interventions are not convincing to him at all. The mind-numbing monotony of life under the sun, the continuous disillusionment of the ever-turning globe has calcified their resistance, blinded their eyes to the truth that sits beyond the sun. Now, Paul turn, now Peter turns the corner because actually he wasn't talking so much about the world. He's talking to and about the saints. And in verse 8 he says, but do not let this one fact escape your notice that with the Lord our God one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. Do not let this one fact escape your notice that God do not, does not view time the way you view time. Understand, Peter says, that time has no bearing on eternity. Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 tells us that God made the sun and the moon to separate the day from the night and to serve as signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So God made time. Time then is a part of creation. And creation is subject to time. If we didn't have time, we wouldn't know what time we're supposed to be gathering for church. If we didn't have time, we wouldn't know when to report for work. If the farmer didn't have time, he wouldn't be able to coordinate the seed time and the harvest time. We need time. Time is useful for us. But time serves no purpose for God. God doesn't need time. God doesn't measure anything by time. And God doesn't determine his actions according to time. God has all the time in the world. And then some. He sees a thousand years as one day. God sees one day as a thousand years. Here's a funny thought. If in God's economy, a thousand years is just one day, this means that if I live to be 100 years old, my lifespan in God's eyes will have been two hours and 15 minutes. That's a very humbling thought. That to God, I am no more than a blip on a radar. My entire life up to 100 years old would only equate to two hours and 15 minutes of living. This humbling thought teaches me to not take myself and my embryonic thoughts too seriously. I haven't been here but for a moment. And if in God's economy one day is as a thousand years, then how old would I be today? Today I would be 20,493,000 years old. This is a scary thought because with age should come wisdom and responsibility. This incites in me a sense of duty and the, the call to grow up into spiritual maturity. God does not view me the way I view myself. My time and my tenure do not mean the same thing to God that it does to me. My experiences do not mean the same things to God that they do to me. Because God does not measure me in relation to time. And I should not measure God in relation to time. If the president at your job called a meeting with you, and he said, I want you to be at my office at 9 o'clock in the morning, you would try to be at his office, I'm sure, 15 minutes early, sitting outside his door, waiting for the president to have this big meeting with you. He's supposed to be there at 9 o'clock. He said you guys are going to meet at 9 o'clock, but the president doesn't show up until 11 o'clock. Which of you is going to tell the president, you're late? Why not? Because the president is not on your time, you are on his and you have no right to judge the president as being early or late. Peter says in verse 9, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. And how do some determine slowness? In accordance with human time. The Lord is not slow. And furthermore, the Lord cannot be slow because slowness and fastness only exist in time. 
Time only has authority over creation and not over eternity. The Lord is not slow, but he is patient toward you. He is not slow, he is patient. And there's a big difference between slowness and patience. To be slow means to function at low speed. God is not slow. But to be patient means to tolerate delays. And the delay that God is tolerating is not a delay on his part, but it is a delay on our part. We are slow. Humanity is slow. Slow to believe, slow to accept Jesus Christ as Lord, slow to deny ourselves, slow to be sanctified. We are slow. God is patient. Jesus Christ has not returned as yet, not because Jesus is slow, but because we are. And God in his patience for us tolerates our slowness for our sakes. Because God, Peter says, is not willing for anyone to perish. And God knows that if he were to return right now, this very moment, many of us, even some of us in this room, many of us would not make it in. And this has been the situation since the beginning, brothers and sisters. Man refuses to grow up. Man moves too slow. Humanity refuses to open our eyes and to see the truth that Jesus Christ is coming again. And he will judge the living and the dead, just as the prophets and the apostles have said. But bound by our sins and by our lusts, we subconsciously fend off any possibility of Christ's return so that we can enjoy one more day of pleasure under the sun. We are willfully ignorant. We make ourselves ignorant of the return of Jesus Christ, and we resist. And so Peter says, God patiently waits for as many as will to come to repentance. And so you and I have to ask ourselves the question today. It is a personal and a private spiritual question. How often do you ponder the second coming of Jesus Christ? Are you living your life in such a way fully conscious that Jesus Christ is coming soon? Is there an urgency about your life and about your lifestyle? Is there an urgency within you to always repent and to keep short accounts with God, recognizing the truth that he's coming soon? Or are you like the mocker, saying subconsciously within yourself, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since I can't remember, all things remain as they always were. There are many Christians whom, when they're honest with themselves, will admit the truth, that quite infrequently they even consider the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're living today for today alone with no true consciousness that at any moment Jesus Christ could split the clouds and return in his glory. How often do you think about it? During this Advent season, I have been struck by my own lack of consciousness regarding future things. You see what happens when you, when you begin to ignore the warning signs of the second coming of Jesus Christ, what happens is that you first become complacent. Then your priorities get all mixed up and you start majoring on the minors and not paying attention to the future. When you take your eyes off of the second coming of Jesus Christ, when you do not daily remind yourself that any moment Jesus could come again, sin becomes much easier to fall into because you are no longer conscious of the judgment that is to come. And so Peter writes this message to them and he says, I want to stir up your sincere minds. I know you're sincere, but I also know that complacency is very real. And when you keep coming to church week after week, month after month, the whole religious thing, the whole religious practice can become so monotonous. And the gospel can become unbeknown to you, nothing more than a fairy tale. Peter wants to remind you that this word is true. And Jesus Christ will come again. And we want to be ready. Let's pray. Prone to wander, Lord, we feel it, and prone to leave the God we claim to love. Each of us in this moment of reflection, as we're being honest with ourselves, each of us can admit that sometimes, and maybe even very often for some of us, we are not looking forward, we are not living in anticipation of your second coming. For many of us, our spiritual senses have been dulled to the point where we're simply going through the road of religion lifting up our hands more out of habit than out of eager anticipation that you will in fact come. This morning we repent 
as we examine ourselves, Father, you know our hearts and you know our intentions. You know that our hearts and our minds are sincere. But you also know, God, that we are easily distracted from spiritual things. During this season of Advent, Lord God, I pray that you will allow all of us to recalibrate, to reprioritize, and to place your second coming at the top of our priority list, that we would be conscious of your second coming in this season, that we will look to your second coming both as a joyous occasion, but also as a day of judgment. We open ourselves to you this morning. Holy Spirit, examine our hearts, shine your light into our hearts, and show us those areas within ourselves that are stubborn to change, that are mired in the monotony of casual sin. I pray that you would deliver us, that you would renew our faith, and that by your grace we would come back to our first love. Thank you for this season. Thank you for this reminder in Jesus' name. Amen.